Good morning. Welcome back to Homestead Education Week. We have a fun interview planned for you today. We are going to be talking with Appalachian Homestead, a 10th generation homestead, a family that has been living this life for a very long time. And I've also got my sidekick here with me today. <laughs> Josh is tuning in with this live. I'm going to join the conversation and we're excited to hang out with y'all. So I'm going to add Appalachian Homestead here and let them join the conversation. And while I'm doing that, you want to talk a little bit about what we're doing this week and Homestead Education Week and what it is and what it's about? Yeah, so the big idea is that there seems to be a, an, an overwhelming desire for homesteading information, and that looks a lot different to me. started to an individual like we're going to be talking to today who their family has been in it for like 75 years mm -hmm. so there's obviously a wide range of knowledge and we know that there are homestead conferences all across the country um, and some of them are better than others as you would uh, imagine some of them are expensive some of them aren't but not everybody can make their schedules line up so we thought we would uh, do kind of a digital version of that and have as many wide ranging topics as we could and invite people from all different walks of life to come and share some of their knowledge, not only with us, but with, with you guys as well. So uh, obviously it's free. Uh, we, we wanted to kind of bring it to you uh, in, in a digital format and uh, you can take notes, you can go back and you can have this kind of in your library uh, anytime you want to go back and kind of revisit some of the topics that we talk about. So in a nutshell, that's it. All right, so uh -oh. she's trying to join, guys. We're working on it here. So if you're watching, go ahead and leave us a comment and tell us where you're watching from. Um, oh, there's somebody in Canada. Hey, Canada. Hi, Canada. It's a little warm in here. I'm taking my jacket off. We've already been outside and in the garden a little bit this morning. Well, we're, we're certainly feeling the benefits of spring coming. It's about 70 degrees outside this morning. I know some of our, our followers that are uh, out west and up north, they're, they're not getting that warm weather quite yet, so yeah. we're very fortunate. Yeah, we keep getting messages like, oh, your sunny weather's making me sad. We've still got snow. <laughs> we haven't had any snow this year, and you will not see me shed one single tear for that. I hate snow. I don't think I think we've seen a single flurry this year, which is a little bit unusual. We usually see a little bit. Lots of Ohio people watching. We like Ohio. We've been to Ohio. We might have somebody from Ohio coming to Carolina here pretty soon. The NFL draft. Oh, that's right. The Ohio State. Well, it's not letting me add her for some reason. I'm wondering if Maybe she's, Shallon, if you're here and you're seeing this, will you just drop a comment? I'm not sure if maybe she's just not on here yet. We'll give her a few more minutes. So we're going to be talking with the Appalachian Homestead, and they've been doing this, like we said, for a long time, 10 generations. That's not been our story. We're kind of a first generation form. So, but we both have a little bit of history in our families of farming. So your grandparents farmed a bit. Wanna... Yeah, so my, my dad's parents, um, uh, my, my grandfather grew up on a farm probably about 20 miles from actually where we live now, maybe 25 miles. Um, I had 12 boys and girls. Um, it was kind of the definition of, of a bunch of poor southern farmers. Um, and they grew up there on the farm, one of those things where they made just about everything that they had. They grew most of the things that they ate. Um, and of course, as my grandfather, his name was Warner, uh, as he grew up and had his own family, of course, my dad and my aunt came into, into the world and he carried some of those traditions as well. And while they didn't necessarily have a, a large farm growing up, they did do backyard gardening. They did raise a good amount of their food, uh, because as is the story with a lot of folks from, from that generation. Uh, they weren't what you would consider well-off. And so anything to help alleviate cost at home mm -hmm. was
was something that they would embrace. Now, my mom's parents, um, they, they always did a, a garden as well. I can remember my grandfather, um, he, he would grow tomatoes, and that was kind of his prize, prize uh, uh, vegetable that he would grow. And I can remember being five, six, seven, eight years old and going out in his backyard, and he would have tomato cages that were taller than I, I was. Aww, so cool. um, th those, those kind of stick in mind. But now you, on the other hand, your, your family mm -hmm. actually has legit farmers in, mm -hmm. in it. So why don't you talk about that? Yeah, so my mom's parents um, had a big commercial chicken farm. And I've got an uncle that has a commercial chicken farm. And hogs. And Yeah, and they farm hogs as well. Um, so I have some extended family that is farming. They don't live super close to us, but they're in North Carolina. Um, and then my papa, who was the farmer, he has now passed away. But I have a lot of memories as a kid of, like, visiting the farm. And Papa would always be in his chair with the farmer's almanac, you know, and looking at his planting calendar. He would plant by the moon. And, and Cheryl was a cool guy because he would get up at, you know, 4, 4.30 in the morning, and he would go out and he would tend to the, tend to the chickens and feed the chickens, feed the, the cows, that sort of thing. And by about 7.30, 8 o'clock, he would come inside, eat breakfast, and then he, he, would, he would get in his chair, in his recliner <laughs> chair. Yeah. He, He'd read his almanac. <laughs> and then he would fall asleep while he was reading. And he would sleep for about an hour, hour and a half. Then he'd get up and he'd go work some, some yep. more. Then he'd come back in and do the same thing all over Another again. Another little nap. <laughs> but, like, I think back on that, and I think that's given me, like, a little bit of, I don't know, maybe the word is, like, permission mm -hmm. to slow things down. Because when, when you're farming, there's always something to do. Like we always have a massive list of things to do and you just, you can't always get them done, you know? So I try to remember Papa took naps, you know, Papa sat down and ate lunch in the middle of the day. He didn't just run, run, run and burn himself out. And that's why he was able to live and farm for 80 plus years. Mm. So. so let me ask you this as technically a first generation homesteader, mm -hmm. Uh, what are some things that you would like to have in place for our kids, not only as they grow and they, they leave the nest, but maybe at some point when, when we want to pass this on to them and kind of help them get started, what are some traditions that you would like for them to have? Mm, that's a good question. I don't know. I just hope that they will always have a garden of some sort. Like, even if they end up in a city, which I don't really see either of our kids being city people. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, but like they, they just all, both love being out in the country. Um, but I, I hope that they will always grow food in some capacity, whether it's just a small one bed garden or whether it's, you know, multiple. So I see a text. Okay, I think they're ready. Let's try to add them again. All right. <laughs> here they are. I see them. They're here. We're deep couch sitting. It's kind of hard to get up. I got to work my way up here. Here they come. Let's see if they'll jump in here. I'm gonna have to sit up. Hey. Hey, how are you? I'm all right, I'm gonna get around here. I'm gonna try to scoop this out so Mark can come over here. He's working a little bit on a spreadsheet. Um, sorry, I didn't notice that it was already 10 after. You're good, you're good. I'm trying to get myself adjusted here. That's so what are you guys talking about? I, I caught just the edge of you talking about being first generation homesteaders. Yeah. So we were kind of sharing like how we both had some grandparents or great grandparents that had formed. Um, and then it kind of got lost um, somewhere, somewhere between there and here. And we're kind of picking it back up. And so now we're more of a first generation homestead starting over. But we do have like some family legacy that we can pull from, but we're really excited to hear about you guys because 10 generations, right? Yes. So our grandson will be number 10. So we're number eight, but they're 10 deep now on the compound. But really before that, that's 10 that we can account for. Really most people, and you know, you guys say you're first generation. I think everybody comes from homesteading. That's the yeah. origins of the nation. Just some families, 
continued it even post industrial revolution and others didn't. Yeah. I love that you always have like a unique perspective because you didn't learn this stuff from a book or from YouTube or, you know, from following somebody on Instagram. You had family that really kind of taught you this stuff, right? Right. So when we were coming and the same for you, right, Mark, he's still working. Sorry. And his grand, like his grandparents, parents, and all of our, I had all the way through. So my great grandmother and all of her sisters lived well until I was a great big girl, like in my teenage years. And my grandmother lived until I was 20. Um, and my other grandmother actually lived till I was 30, 33 or 34. Okay. So and all her sisters, her her last sister just passed away, you know, this last February, and she was 95. Wow. So I had all these really much older people to kind of pour it into us, plus my parents, and, you know, they had their great-grandparents. and um, So, no, I didn't have to learn it from a book or from Instagram, and for the most part, I don't. I don't use Instagram for that. Like, I love to see what other people are doing. I enjoy it occasionally I see something and I'm like, Oh, that's really neat. I would have never thought of that, you know? Yeah. But for the most part, I'm not really like looking for gardening advice or stuff like that. I, I try a lot of like recipes and stuff. If I see something that just really sounds good to me and things like that, but for the gardening and stuff, I had my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, and then all of the family journals and books and things. And um, storytelling is a really big part of Appalachian culture. You know that because you're you grew up kind of in the foothills, right? Yeah, absolutely. So your your guys' family probably told lots and lots of stories to you. Uh, what are you talking about? Her family still tells stories to me all the time. <laughs> Mine too. I literally, when I was just saying that, I was thinking about my daddy and my daughter. They are two of the biggest storytellers that I have ever, you cannot sit down next to them without getting a story. And most of the time it's my daughter repeating something that my dad has told her. Like, and it's sometimes it's really funny stuff, like how the uh, Pacific Ocean filled up from potato, you know, from digging the rows for the potatoes and the, it split, she would have to tell a story. He tells her stories. Every time we're doing anything, it's a story fest. So when we're canning, when we're gardening, when we're starting seeds, when we're just sitting around, it's yeah. a story. And all the stories that I was told and that they're now being told are stories that pertain to how to do things. And they make it fun. It's hilarious. You'll be telling them stories, you know, while they're digging the rows to put the potatoes in or while they're, um, they was peeling potatoes one time and he told them about how he cut his thumb off one time peeling 500 bushels of tomato or potatoes to, you know, it's just fun stories. And he makes everything fun. And so does my mom and my grandparents are very much like that. So basically, so basically when you guys are together and you're, you're, you're working together, you're, you're, you're doing life obviously side by side. Mm -hmm. It's not like you actually have just a task that you got to do. You're just enjoying each other's company. For the most part. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're a family. And I know that, like, in today's world, that's different. A lot of families don't enjoy each other's company. But we really do. Yeah. I mean, we, every family has differences. And, and, of course, we do, too, sometimes. And we get in little arguments about how we're doing this or that. But we love each other more than the thing that we're arguing about. Sure. Absolutely. So sometimes the newer generations can bring in, like, a different way of doing something. For instance, um, Daddy, well, he still does it in his garden. Daddy always cuts and grays off his potatoes. I have grown a little bit lazy, and sometimes I will throw the whole potato down. Um, and, you know, just stuff like that. And he'll be like, you don't need to do that. You're just wasting it. You're just wasting it. And we'll, <laughs> you know. I can remember stories from, from my dad. His dad grew up on a farm. Um, big family, like 12 brothers mm -hmm. and sisters, and everything was done by hand mm -hmm. uh, when, when, when he was a kid. And of course, as he became an adult, uh, the Ford tractor kind of revolutionized farming a little bit. Yes. And he was 
real resistant to having any type of machinery on the farm because it was either going to ruin the soil or it was going to damage the crops in some way. Yes. It's always it's always funny to hear the differences and, and, and how some will embrace it and others won't. Yeah. Didn't he used to eat canned food too? He would not eat canned food. Like store canned. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He said he said there's no way he would eat that food. <laughs> Well, my grandfather was like that. He wouldn't eat nothing that didn't come out of a glass jar that he canned himself. Yeah. I think that comes from, you know, because you don't, I don't know how y'all are, but we're pretty particular about, like, I won't eat just everybody's canned food because you just don't know how well they did it, you know? Yeah. So... I think in like the older generation's mind when like the metal cans of food became available, they didn't know. They did not know how well those people might have done it. Plus it was in metal and they might have been distressful of that because they saw the rings on their drawers rust. Yeah. And then they wondered what was inside those metal cans to keep them from yeah. rusting. Absolutely. So yeah. yeah, I totally understand where he came from <laughs> on that. Okay. And my great like that. So I'm curious, like, I know you have a different perspective because you've been doing this a while. And homesteading, I, I say that in quotes, it's become very trendy here lately. And it seems like everybody's talking about it. Everybody's, you know, saying they want to do it. What is some homesteading advice that you have heard on the internet that is ridiculous? <laughs> we want you to tell us what, what's ridiculous. I don't really think you want me to do this. <laughs> Mark's over here commenting. He says, hand pollinating squash, tickling your tomatoes. Um, what are some other things? Not touching the soil. Oh, and not, and you know, a lot of people think it's terrible to turn the soil, mm -hmm. to till it. That's actually biblical, to turn, turn your soil. Yeah. And a lot of people get really excited over tilling it doesn't have to be the devil can it be sure if you're tilling up ten thousand acres to plant one kind of vegetable and you're never rotating it and you're never doing anything to preserve that soil or to regenerate that soil in any way whatsoever absolutely that's terrible you should never do that but like us you know we till but we plant in patches so we till up, you know, 100 by 100 over here, and it's full of just papers. And we till up 100 by 100 over here, and it's full of just beans. And then, you know, in different places, different things. And we rotate. Mm -hmm. So you're creating a good cycle of soil regeneration. You know, you put, the, for instance, the beans in first. And then the next thing you follow it with is a leafy green, uh, and sometimes squash because they're high feeders. And you can plant those together, the squash and leaf, leafy greens. And the squash will shade the leafy greens. The leafy greens will stay longer into the season without bolting. Spinach, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you move on. Then the next year, you may have um, potatoes or something like that that follows it. So you go from, you go through the cycle and then you come back around to those legumes again. And you're just replenishing and slowly depleting and replenishing and slowly depleting, you know, whether it's rotating your corn or whatever. Corn follows beans a lot, too. Yeah. Um, so that, the, the till and being evil is one. <laughs> um, and another thing that we do to regenerate the soil is, and we talk about this all the time, is burning off the garden. Do you all do that? You have, do you have raised beds or do you till? <clears throat> we have kind of. A mix. So we have a raised bed garden, and then we have our tomato garden. It's just in the ground, and then we've also got a big pumpkin patch as well. And it, it's in ground. Yeah, it's in the ground. Right. And do y'all burn it off? Do you we know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. uh -uh. So about that, what what does that look like for you guys? Okay. So one thing, this is just how we do it. So at the end of the garden season. We don't compost our spent plants because that's a good way to get disease into your next year's garden. If you put it into your compost and it has a late season blight that you haven't, it hasn't exhibited itself, but it's there. Yeah. Then you just put blight into your compost. So instead, we pull up everything. 
we turn the soil with the tiller. The birds are flying south. This is in the fall. They stop. They eat every little bug that they can find that you've turned up out of that soil. And all the while, your spent plants are drying. And then it's time to rake the leaves, right? So then we rake up the leaves and we put them on top of the garden. And sometimes we have twigs that have fallen. You know, we don't put big logs because we're not trying to have a bonfire. But we'll have like small, you know, like this branches and we'll put those on top of it. And then we'll come along and we'll put like straw or something on top of it. And then we'll light that fire and we'll have dug a trench around the garden and it won't get loose and go and catch the world on fire. And we burn that off. And then we turn all that ash into the soil. So you're putting that carbon back in. Right. That's so cool. So we, we do almost the same thing as far as adding the layers in the fall leaves and all that. But we've not burned it. That's interesting. We just leave it and then kind of turn it in in the spring. Well, if you burn it off, we do that. We usually do that twice. So okay. if you burn it off, what you're doing is one thing is you're killing, like if you did have that late season blight that hadn't really exhibited itself, but the, it's in the soil or in those plants, that kills it because the high heat. Um, it'll also kill out things that might overwinter in your soil. So like those Japanese beetles overwinter in the soil, and then they come out, they eat your, your green beans and stuff all spring, and you just have skeletons where leaves were. Yeah. Um, that'll take care of that. Uh, squash bugs, uh, all different types of bugs and caterpillars. That'll take care of them. And I know people get a little bit excited about that because they're like, those are necessary. And they are necessary in nature, but they are absolutely not necessary in my garden. Exactly. <laughs> you know, they have their purpose. Everything under the sun has a purpose. Yeah. But not everything belongs in my garden. And so that's one thing that we do. And we do that in all the patches. Um, and, and then we do that again in the spring. Okay. Because always, inevitably, all year long, more leaves fall more little sticks and branches fall you're getting more hay and straw falling all over the place in the barn and you just gather that up and bring it put it on and you do that two more times in the spring before you plant the very first thing so anything you didn't get in the fall you're catching with that spring anyway things that might be starting to come from way deeper are going to come up and when you turn it the birds are flying back north they get to eat and then you burn it and you're taking anything that may have somehow made it through the last time and you're getting rid of it that's the reason we don't have pests in our garden that's so cool i've never i've never heard of that we yeah. might need to try that See, mark says how... mark says also the herbs which we do put a ton of herbs you know yeah yeah we plant a lot of herbs yeah we, we do too. that a lot of companion planting mm -hmm. i mean there obviously there are some what well, well i guess people would call them pests but there are some insects you want in your garden we we try to encourage bees and things of that nature so oh yeah for pollination but you know you're absolutely right just because it's alive doesn't mean it needs to be in my garden that's right <laughs> especially those japanese beetles i hate those things that, right. awesome. i mean they'll destroy your whole place i mean they will just turn your green i don't know how yours is but if if japanese i've seen like other places and they will leave a skeleton yes like we've, we've had that literally happen. just a leaf skeleton hanging there and i'm just like dang on i'm glad i don't got that problem <laughs> my my dad has a pretty large vineyard uh, at his house that they he's kept increasing every year mm -hmm. uh, i think it was two years ago they had an infestation of japanese beetles and it decimated the crop i mean and it didn't matter what he put out what he did that it was too far gone before before you ever really even noticed that it was there. And it just wiped out every one of his grape plants. And, grape and I know plants. you've seen them too. So they get on those grape leaves and they pile them for their mating. Yeah. And then they go and they lay and that leaves in the soil. So when you burn that off, you're getting rid of it. Of course, you can't burn your grapevines up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you could burn in between the rows. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Sure could. You could burn off those in between. So, okay, what about, I know you and I texted about this a little bit the other night. Let's talk about seeds a minute. Okay. So, there's like this viral thing, and it's going around a lot right now because it's spring, where people are keeping seeds like in photo boxes and, and lots of different things. <laughs> and I want you to tell us why 
that's not a good idea because if you're watching this, it's really not a good idea long term. So right, that's that's not a long term solution. Gosh, I get in so much trouble every time I talk about this. I make somebody mad. Okay, so I'm telling her to share this. So y'all come for me, not her. <laughs> So, okay, so, you know, like, my mom's grandfather started the greenhouse business in 1939, 1938, somewhere in there. And back then, and if, you if you've ever seen my aunt, we will talk about it. They didn't have, they had ice boxes. They didn't have freezers. Mm -hmm. That's a relatively new thing. Um, she said it was, like, post-World War II. She talked about, that's in a highlight somewhere. Anyway, so they had to keep their seeds in the spring house because that was the coolest place they had so the, the idea was that you keep them a stable temperature year round uh in your dairy in your cellar whatever but the main most important thing is that they have to be kept completely dry and they have to, and then after that the second most important thing is that they have to be kept at a stable temperature so as it came forward and then they got freezers and things um they started keeping them in the freezer because the freezer is a stable temperature all the time. Don't keep them in the door of your freezer because sometimes you open and close it and that's not necessarily exactly stable. But in the back of the freezer, mm -hmm. if you went to my parents' house right now, in the back of the freezer would be packs of every imaginable, imaginable seed, look, every imaginable seed. Mm -hmm. Daddy keeps, and especially like her green beans, Lord have mercy, if you were to leave, even vacuum sealed, the way that we do it. If you were to leave it on a shelf in the basement, my daddy went in there and found it, he'd have a stroke. <laughs> he would absolutely have a stroke and kill us all. <laughs> because those particular seeds, you know, were my papa's greasy beans seed line that came off the poor farm with him and they were just precious in his eyes. And so he wants to take great care of them. Well, my mom's grandfather was the same way, all their seed lines and stuff. Those seeds are precious. That is food off your family table if you don't store them properly. So when you put them in these plastic containers and they look really cute and I think it's really aesthetic. I think, you know, it is just, it is, it is really aesthetic to look and it's just so pleasing to the eye, but you have to remember that just because it's pleasing to the eye doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Is it okay? Is it okay for a month or two? Sure. But as soon as you have planted those seeds or started, started those seeds. They need to go back in packs and into your freezer where they will stay a stable temperature in, and they're sealed, all the air is sealed out of them, tight, nicely stored. And then next year, if it makes you feel better, take them out of the freezer and put them in your plastic box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if nothing else, I think making sure that you're keeping a supply that's always in your freezer is yes. just Yes, so that, can, that actually extends the life. So we didn't, I didn't make it to that, but that actually extends the life by years. Mm -hmm. I put out a, a, did I send it to you? That chart that tells you about how long the seed life is. No, I'll, I'll have to send it to you. But I, I put out a chart, and maybe in my squares somewhere. I think I did it last year. Um, how long it'll last if you just leave it on your shelf versus how long it'll last if you store it properly, vacuum sealed and put into your freezer. So, you know, of course, mom has a whole freezer just for seeds. But that's your future. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, if it really hit the fan and you're storing your seeds not somewhere with a stable temperature. And I realize if it hits the fan, we're not gonna have freezers either. But you need to find somewhere, whether it's your cellar, your dairy, a spring house, you know, somewhere that is pretty much a stable temperature all the time. Mm -hmm. And you can do that if you, you dig, like even if you have, you know those new, I don't know what they're calling them, they call them a cellar, I think, but people <laughs> are digging like a freezer into the ground and they're digging it so far down, I think like below the frost line, of course. Yeah. Um. And then they're covering it back up and just having the pipe for like moisture and stuff. Well, if you dig so far down, it is a stable temperature. That's why you can do that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in, in a real situation, you could do that. That's good. Good advice. Yeah. You know, I can remember stories from my dad. Uh, Dad's a, a, a contractor um, and done, done work for lots of folks. Um, 
there was one guy in particular that comes to mind, and he, he did exactly what you're talking about. He kept his seeds in the freezer. Now, again, my, my parents have done that for years, and I'm sure they picked that up from their parents. But this older older man, he had, uh, I remember in particular, white cucumbers that they had had in their family since like the 1960s. Yeah. And they would save their seeds and they would put them back and they, they, they had the same line that they would keep in the family and they kept in the freezer for, you know, what, what is that now, like 60 some years? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing uh, to think of the longevity and that the food source is always there if you take care of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's one reason we do it. And I have a jar of seed. My papa's been dead 30 years. Yeah, 30. He died when I was 10. That's the, the poor farm papa, the one that started the camp, the compound. So I have a jar of seeds that he was the last jar that he saved. Of course, daddy planted some of them, and then he saved consecutive years and things like that. It's always been in the freezer. I need to get them out and see. 30 years out, will they still make? Yeah. To, it'd be interesting to know. But I can tell you for sure, you know, 8, 10, 12 years out, they will. Mm -hmm. yeah. At least at a 80 to 85% germination rate. Yeah. So I bet those 30-year-old seeds, at least some of them would still make. I think I so, planted some last summer that were from 2011 that Josh's dad had saved, and we had them in the freezer. And, I mean, we have great germination. I was surprised honestly I thought with them being that many years old but I mean they did just as good as like all those new seeds that I just bought and, and just because you have new seeds doesn't mean the germination rate is going to be any better yes I mean that's something that we were surprised with as we were getting started because you spend all this time and effort and money on these new seeds that are supposed to have all of these great characteristics and then you know you plant let's say you plant 50 of them and you get five that pop up or you plant 50 of them and then five of them turn out to be something that they weren't even supposed to be <laughs> like where they were mislabeled or missorted. We've had that happen quite a few times when we fall seeds. Yeah, we, I won't name it, but there was a particular seed company that was really popular in recent years that I thought, Oh, that looks fun. I think I'll try some of those. And their germination rates were terrible. And those were new seeds. But like you were saying, you know, and it, I really, it really comes from that proper storage, you know, with them being stored in the freezer for that long. The germination rates that come from our family lines, which go all the way back to the poor farm, and then some of them go even back further if they were on my grandma, because my grandfather's parents died. So he was on the poor farm as an orphan during the Great Depression, and then until he was old enough to come off. Um, so my grandmother, though, that he married, we had purple tips that came from her grandfather. Wow. And, you know, like my mom's side, we have things that have come down through the line further back. I don't know why we, I guess because we like to eat them so much, but Papa's greasy beans that came off the poor farm with him are the prize. Oh. Everything else is okay, but the, the maybe it's because we loved him so much. Yeah. Yeah. Anything. That's such a neat connection. Yeah. So... Those seed lines, though, and we, Daddy always plants a little bit of everything every year of those because he wants to make sure that they're alive, you know, to be used later in the event. He calls it seed insurance. Yeah. <laughs> so in the event that some of those older ones don't make or something happens that might destroy part of them. And the other thing is he keeps them in different places. That's smart. You know, not ha having all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Sure. That's really smart. So he keeps some at my son's house and some at my house and some at my brother's house and some at their house and some in the freezers that are out in the spring house. And it's, he just says, you know, if anything ever happens to this, I got this one and, you know, on and on and on. And I think people don't realize how important it is to not have all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I love the idea of like passing on seeds to the next generation. <laughs> family like how cool would it be if 10 generations from now if Jesus hadn't come back by then like <laughs> our grandchildren are like let's go get some granny amber tomatoes out of the freezer like that makes my heart happy I want to leave that kind of legacy for my family yes and you know and that will happen I have I mean if 
if Jesus don't come back. And it just looks like any minute it might happen, <laughs> don't it? <laughs> but if the world continues, your generations will do that. I have no doubt of it. Mm -hmm. Because one thing, you're cultivating a love of family going down the line, and you'll be very involved in your grandchildren's lives. And you will be the story, just like my, you know, Papa talking about his grandmother who raised him until she died and he went to the fourth farm. Um, and then, like, my mom talking about her grandmother. And on back, everybody loves, well, not everybody, I guess, but in our family, everybody loved their grandparents. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And you're cultivating that kind of love in your family. Yeah, yeah that's what we hope for, for sure. So let me, let me shift gears on you here for just a second. Let's say that the, the bottom falls out tomorrow. Life as we know it looks a little bit different than it does now. What are a handful of things that you guys do on your farm that wouldn't change? What are the, 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 your mainstays for things that you're going to grow, things that you're going to continue to do, animals that you're going to keep? What would that look like? Well, for one thing, horses would not be a thing because <laughs> what do they do? <laughs> they, they, eat, they eat money and poop work. Yes. <laughs> yes, they do. And they're fragile, and they die really easily. They're like glass ornaments on steel. Yeah. Um, I think that we would always, you know, keeping, for instance, chickens and pigs, you're just going to give them your food scraps, what you don't eat. But there's going to be fewer of it. But they can go out and forage and root around and find things, you know. So those would be easy keepers still. Um, cows probably would be a little more iffy. You'd have skinny cows because yeah. here you you have to do some supplemental feeding. You can't just turn them out on pasture and leave them forever right. because we have a winter and things die away and there's just not as much free forage. And I know that a lot of people say, oh, I only want grass raised. But that's fine. And, and that might work for a while. But it's reproduction. Not reality. Reproduction, for one thing, is going to do, diminish as your nutri as their nutrition diminishes. So you're going to be stopping, you know, being able to have more be birthed by this set of breeders that you may have. Um, so cows will be for a while, but maybe not, not for long term. Um, we're always going to hunt, fish, and forage because wild things are going to last a very long time in it because they do, they, they're used to living on their own with no help from us and they're going to reproduce and do their own thing. Um, just like they do already. So probably, and we use deer as like a, a main source of red meat anyway, because it's just cheaper. So we're always going to continue to do that. Um, growing like vegetables wise, we probably would keep growing all the things we grow, which would be probably different amounts of it because, well, I don't know. We probably still would be trading and, and selling things. So we're always going to grow tomatoes, always going to grow squash and peppers and green beans and potatoes. And I can't think of a vegetable we cut loose. Can you? Stop. That we would stop growing if it hit the fan. Maybe watermelons. Well, yeah, maybe watermelons. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's kind of yeah, Mark says watermelons is a luxury. I would agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mark said plant more zucchini than you need because you can make anything out of cans of zucchini. That's true. You, That's can, you really can. Mock. It tastes like whatever you want it to. You, you can mock it to anything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to make mock chicken with his zucchini. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, you, you were mentioning chickens and pigs. Now, we don't have any pigs just yet, but we probably will at some point. Mm -hmm. But I was really surprised. When we first got started, I didn't want chickens because I, I viewed having another set of animals as just another headache. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've seen all of the trouble that you, you talked about horses. You know, you, you have a vet on call all the time to keep that stupid thing alive because it's just, <laughs> it's just trying to die on you. It um, is. That's really how I've... I've you chickens but boy was i wrong chickens are so easy yeah if you keep if you keep them watered and you keep them fed and they've got a place to kind of get out of the elements they take care of themselves and i was amazed at the amount of scraps not only that we make mm -hmm. but what they actually eat and clean up because we don't have to throw any of our food scraps away hardly at all we don't either they're like the uh 
what do you call that thing that's in your sink that people mm. use? Oh, it's garbage. Garbage. they're like a garbage disposal. Yeah. Well. I don't have one. I have chickens for that. Um, but they are, they're like a, a walking garbage disposal and they're hardy. Yeah. You know, people get excited about their chickens and I get a lot of questions about chickens and it'll be like, you know, um, it's, it's going to be 10 below zero. Well, just close the coop door. They'll be all right. You know, it's amazing. They can, they can survive stuff. And like, I was super nervous about the idea of processing the chickens when the time came. And we had some chicks and it turned out, you know, when you hatch chicks, you end up with some roosters. And if you get too many roosters, they fight and you have drama. So we started having rooster drama last summer. And we put it into it real quick. Yeah. So we processed for the first time to deal with that. And like, I can honestly say, number one, I was really proud of us when we finished. Like, I felt so capable, like, okay, I've done this. Now we can do it again if we have to. You know, like, yeah. if we had to depend on this, now we know how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But I also felt like, I don't know, it makes you feel a little bit empowered because it's like, I don't have to depend on food line up the road if I need meat for my family or you know, same thing with vegetables. Like if I'm able to produce these things at home, it's it's a little bit of peace of mind, you know, that if things get crazy, we've still got a food source. Right. And I think, you know, and that I know, like, and this kind of goes over into preparedness. We can tons, literal tons of food every year. And so did my grandparents and my great grandparents, at least back to them and really further and back all into fermentation. But we do that because we know, and I'll never forget my grandmother. Literally, this is like one of those things that you never forget. She said it so often and in the same way, um, she would she would lean, but there was a kitchen window and always looked over the garden and Pavel would be out there working literally from sun up to sundown. And I would be in her house and she'd be feeding me or something, you know, and she'd be, she always leaned the same way on that window, just like this right here. And she'd turn over her shoulder and talk to me because the table was like right here. And she'd say, see that you learned, Cece, because hard times is going to come again. Mm -hmm. You need to pay attention to what we tell you. And it was just like that one little thing. And I, I wouldn't blame like my anxiety on that. <laughs> but that it grabbed my attention, even as a child, that she was, she, they issued those warnings to us constantly. And, you know, when I was a teenager, I thought they were full of it. Yeah. And when I was maybe even in my early 20s, I always went home to help. But I didn't care as much about making sure that I personally was canning thousands of jars of food every year. As I got older, especially after I had children, I was like, oh my gosh, if he lost his job, mm -hmm. if uh, the bottom fell out of the market, if uh, society collapsed, <laughs> you know, any number of things that could happen, you know, and here specifically, what if we get trapped in our house for two weeks by snow? Yeah, yeah that, that, that's very wise because this conversation gets lost on a lot of people, especially when you talk about preparedness because that term has been co-opted by so many idiots and they make, they make it look like something that it's really not. Because being prepared is not necessarily some lunatic waiting for the government to fall. It can look like anything. I mean, you can go back not that far, not that long ago to the crash of the market in 2008. Yeah. That was a real pain for millions of people, regardless of, of what political party you identified with. Those were real times that were really hard. Yep. And those are not once in a lifetime. Those are cyclical, oh. you know, natural disasters. I, I know in our part of the world, uh, we have tornadoes and hurricanes and ice storms and things like that, that a lot of other places don't necessarily have. But, you know, uh, when, when the bottom falls out, that can look a lot different. That could be a job loss. That could be an unexpected illness, yep. uh, financial hardship, whatever it might be. So, that preparedness is key. Yeah. What, if, what if you break your leg and you can't get out to the garden this year? Like, it may not be like the apocalypse, but it could be a life thing. Or let me just whisper this into your ear. It could be blot. Yes, that's a really good point. Because 
it could be blight that blows. Papa always said it blew in. Could be blight that blows in, and your entire harvest this year is now gone. Yeah. So you better hope to the good Lord that you canned up enough last year to last you this winter too. Yeah. Because if you didn't, and your garden harvest is gone, and last year was a great example, you know, with all that rain we had, we lost more than half our harvest. Mm -hmm. So if we had not had a stockpile, we would have run out of tomatoes a long time ago for one thing. Yeah. Um, peppers did great, but tomatoes we would have run out of. And, you know, people just don't realize it. You're right. And you said the word idiot, not me. <laughs> I, I'll wear that. I hat. use that word a lot. I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. But I literally, people don't understand that it's not, I'm not worried about zombies. No. Yeah. I, I'm not at all worried about the tribulation because God's going to take care of me. I'm not worried about that. Not worried about the rapture and maybe being left behind. I, if, if that happens, I'm gone anyway. They can have all I got. Um, but I am worried about being trapped for two weeks by snow. I'm concerned about the potential that Mark could lose his job. I'm concerned, you know, that black could be an issue or flooding, which we wouldn't flood, but for other people. Um, and even in recent years, you know, some of the straight line winds will tear down your corn yeah. and be gone. So you might lose an entire corn harvest to that. Sure. It doesn't have to be. It's just like you said. It don't have to be that we got nuked. That's right. Yeah. It don't have to be that the government fell or, you know, Civil War Part Two or nothing like that. I'm not really worried about those things. I wasn't even worried about the whirly gig that flew over the sky over us. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, that didn't worry me at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I think. I think when people talk preparedness, like there's a place there to introduce some common sense. You know, statistically, if we really think about this, the most likely thing that we need to be prepared for is something like job loss or wedding related or like a disease in the garden or a fungus or something like that. You know, those things are actually fairly likely. Like most of us will deal with them at least once or twice in a lifetime. Um, so I think that's wise. And, you know, and thinking in terms of not just this year, I'm not just growing this for this year, but I'm also growing enough so that next year, if it doesn't go well, I've still got enough that I've harvested and preserved and canned or frozen or whatever. And even the year after, and you know, and this is getting way off topic, but this is a generational thing too, so it'll still apply. Um, people get, just speaking of like things like this, this year, next year, the next year, the next year, people get really excited because uh, some of the newer lids say 18 months. Mm, yeah. And so, so they literally, I've seen people open jars of food and dump them because it's now 18 months old. I still got stuff my papa can. Would I eat it? The quality of it, the mushiness of it would probably be terrible, but it's still sealed and I don't feel that it probably contains yeah. the big B that everybody worries about. Yeah. Um, but it does last much longer. Like the other day when I was doing one of our cooking lives, I pulled out a jar, I was gonna use a jar of tomatoes from 2016. Just to show them that I really would, and I'd feed it to my family. Yeah. And um, I couldn't find that. I had seen it earlier in the day, and I thought, I'm going to get that. And I must have got it out and said it, and then I don't know where I said it in my pantry. Because I lose things like that, and I lose words, as you notice. <laughs> <laughs> but I ended up doing, I think it was a 2019 or 2020 jar. But these jars of food, Papa wouldn't have thrown out no food. No. I mean, Josh, your parents can, right? Yes, ma'am. Amber, do yours too? No. They don't. So Josh's cans, I guarantee you, your mommy and daddy have never took a jar of food out and said, oh, Lord, we canned this four years ago. I better throw it away. I and think we've eaten 10-year-old green beans at his mama's before, and they were fine. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I can give you a perfect example. My, my dad is very much into being prepared for anything. Mm -hmm. That goes back to when we were kids. In 1989, Hurricane Hugo came through, and we were without power for, I think it was 16 days. Mm -hmm. We had no generator. We, you know, we, were, we lived in the woods. It was a pretty rough time. With that being said, he, from that moment on, he said, that won't happen to me again. Mm -hmm. And so he's prepared. 
So fast forward to now the year's 2023, him and my mom, uh, they made pancakes last weekend with pancake mix from their stores uh, that I believe had expired in like 2011 or 2012. Yeah. Were, <laughs> she had to add some baking powder. Well, yeah. said, like, that didn't, that, I guess that didn't last. But. Yeah, it was a little bit flat. But <laughs> uh, as far as, you know, being unsafe, it's not. Right. If you it properly, like food can last a very long time. It's really interesting that he brought up Hurricane Hugo. I'm going to tell you my connection to that. Okay. In 1989, Pitts and Coal went on strike. My daddy was a coal miner. My papa was a coal mine retiree. The reason they went on strike is because they cut the pensioners and the widow's benefits. So that cut them. Papa and granny, no money. Daddy and them went on strike, no money. 18 months, we had what we grew, what we foraged, what daddy and my brother and my papa hunted and fished. And that was it. And because they had savings, we didn't lose anything. Of course, my parents didn't believe in like debt, so they didn't have a mortgage or nothing. They had built their houses. They were able to pay for it. So daddy went and did relief work for Hurricane Hugo. Okay. And I think he got paid $100 a week or maybe $200, just a little bit nothing. Yeah. And that $100 or $200 a week is what they used to pay the things that weren't like things that you could really, like your electric bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he stayed gone for I think it was two months down there. I yeah. pictures of it from back during that time. He took all kinds of pictures of the destruction that was Hurricane Hugo. Yeah. So you had you had sixteen days without power. I had eighteen months without food that we didn't grow or forage or you right. know ourselves. But that my grandfather, because of his experience during the Depression and during World War Two. He already, he knew hard times was coming again no matter what. He didn't know it would be the pits and strike in 1989. But he had put thousands of jars of food up. And, um, of course, he had taught all these skills. And we don't talk about skills so much as we talk about the stockpile. But the skill is just as important. Absolutely. And so we were ready. Because of Papa and Granny saying to Daddy all those times, now hard times is going to come again. Hard times, and no doubt his mama and papa said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then they passed that on down. So that's something else that you really should. It is cyclical. Josh said it, and I say it all the time. Things are cyc weather cyclical. Yeah. Hard times, cyclical. The market crashing is cyclical. These banks falling, cyclical. All this is just part of the cycle of this world, the fallen world that we live in. Yeah. Yeah. You can't stop it, but you can you can better prepare for it. Absolutely. And that's a something that, again, generationally was passed down. And you can pass your daddy, the, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. He has spent a good part of his life saying, Josh, you better be that's ready. Right. Don't, don't let yourself be found sleeping. Keep your powder dry. Yeah. Keep your powder dry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just lots of things like that. And you don't yeah. realize in that moment. You know, like how many times Daddy said, "Keep your powder dry." You, you, you don't realize he's imparting that in you as a don't, don't keep your weeks trimmed. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't be found sleeping. Make sure that you're always ready, alert, in season. Yeah. And yeah. And, and that's just a way that that wisdom passes down, and you probably say it to your kids all the time. Yeah, and you don't even realize it. You don't. Yeah, you just, just say it. You know, hard times gonna come again. Grayson and I were talking not before last. I was in the book of Genesis, and um, Josh, you're, you probably have already thought of this, but I was studying the book of Genesis, and um, I was reading, it was after Joseph's family had come down into Egypt, and um, they were already over in the land of Goshen and doing their shepherding and everything, and the, the famine continued and waxed greater and worse, and then the people came, and they're talking about the Egyptians, they came, and they had already given all their money for food. Uh, they had given, I think, all their cattle by this time of food. And then they're coming back and they are saying, let us sell you our servitude for food. Yeah. And, okay. So, okay, we'll give, but they're not asking for food this time. Do you know what they're asking for? Seed. Uh, give us seed in exchange for our servitude. Well, then, like, two, two verses later, they moved them into seed. Like, are you yeah. together with yeah. me? Yeah. 
they moved with me to cities and then the people are like thank you pharaoh you saved their lives uh -huh. and we were talking about that and i was like see do you see the parallel and he said i had never seen the parallel until you just pointed it out but you were so right and that's that's like those things are things that we see it and you know we sit we sit by the way and we talk about it and we yeah and we walk along and we talk about it and those are the same things like probably in my lifetime i'm sure my mom and dad have said things like that and pointed out things in the bible like that to me um i can't remember any off the top of my head but i know they did because they have they are like us very much in that you know we're just shadows of our parents absolutely uh, I don't know how y'all are, but we're just shadows of our parents. Apples don't fall 50 miles from the tree. They fall right at the base. Yeah. So, so that was just one of those things that as we were studying along and I was looking at it and I was thinking, gosh, and the cycle continues. Yeah. Yes, it does. They sold, they sold their freedom in exchange for food security. Like you really think about that? Like there's a lesson there, y'all. There's a lesson there. <laughs> And I'm 40, and literally, I have read that in the Bible 550 million times. And until right in that moment, I hadn't been like, they got about it. I mean, I had read it and passed over it, and probably in my youth thought that'll never happen again. But here we are. Yeah. Here we are. And especially when I got to that verse where it says, and they moved them into cities. It's wild. Yeah, absolutely. Josh is preaching through Genesis right now, so it's funny that you brought that up. That's what we're going through with our, with our church. <laughs> well, I just finished Genesis for like the 55 millionth time. It's one of my, that and um, Exodus, of course. I love the Old Testament. Yeah. I, it's, if you look at the Old Testament, you can, first of all, Jesus is all through it. Absolutely. The foreshadowing of Christ is all the way through all the Old Testament. But it's also, you can see the cycle of what's coming back around. If you just pay attention, it's there. Well, and, and all of the information that we need for how, how we get started, how we do it, it's it's at the beginning. Yes. yes. It's at the beginning. Yes. So. Right. Just like the, the till and the land. Yeah. You're supposed to turn that soil. It's biblical to do that. That's right. And people there's, get a, there's a lot of directions in there that... Like I've studied Deuteronomy. Yeah. That's been like the most recent thing I've done in my personal Bible study. And I've always like kind of felt like, okay, this is not applicable. But now that I'm living on a little farm, all of a sudden Deuteronomy is a treasure trove. Yes. I'm like, there was a reason that God told them to give their land a time to rest. Yeah. You know, the, the directions for crop rotation, for which animals were safe to eat, which were not. Like those principles were to keep them safe and on the right path and they're still there we just gotta go open the book and read them yeah it is so and i could this is something we could talk about all day yeah but I, the old testament so much so many times we're so focused on the gospel in the new testament that we leave the old testament out but they are they have to go together yeah it's, it's one one unit without yeah. one the other isn't you know as great you yeah. have to have both. And I just, Deuteronomy, it's funny you said that because I spent like six years there. I, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. I, I get locked. I, I always say I get locked in places, but I get locked in because it's almost like God's like, like okay, go back to the start. Now take you another yeah. loop. Yep. Okay, now take, take you another loop. And every time you see something new. <laughs> every yep. single time, just like with Genesis, you know, with that story with Joseph, I've read it a million times. And it, I guess I just like read over it, just like reading any other book. And they put them in cities and they thanked them. And this time it jumped out straight out. You know, uh, I, I firmly, firmly believe that the Bible doesn't just tell you what's going to happen. It tells you what always happens. Always. It always, always comes back around. Always. So. Without sale. There is nothing. Is it Ecclesiastes or is it Solomon? I think it was Solomon said there is nothing new. Nothing new under the sun. Yeah. Nothing at all. What is is what will be and what was is what will come. My mother's grandmother, she said that my mother that's re one of that verse like is etched in my brain forever. My mother's grandmother, she said, 
she would sit on the porch swing and rock her to sleep. And she said, from her very earliest memories, that was the verse that her grandmother said to her. Mm -hmm. And she would tell her, now, Cece, whatever has been is what will be. There's not anything new under the sun. Just don't ever forget this. And, you know, it's one of those along the ways, as you go around, as you walk by the way, you know, as they were swinging on the porch. And so many people are leaving these things out and they're not looking back. Everybody says, run back to your roots. Yeah. You can't do that without running back to scripture. That's right. That's where it started. That's right. And <laughs> new things are <laughs> new things are just old things recycled. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So well, I want to be like yeah, sensitive to time. I know we've been chatting yeah. for an hour, but I wanted to say thank you. This has been so fun. I love every time we talk. I'm just like. That is my sister from another mister. I love that the, the legacy you're building for your family there. And uh, I hope one of these days we got great, great, great granddaughters that become friends somehow and talk about their grannies and growing tomatoes and saving seeds in the freezer. <laughs> saving the seeds in the freezer. And I know, I'm sorry, we got way off of being 10 generations. No, no that's nice. fine. Well, that's the heart of it, though. And that's the part we want people to take away from this. You know, we say all the time, it's faith, family, and the farm. Well, we say it in that order because that's the order it's got to go in or it's all going to fall apart. Like, your faith has to be the first thing. Absolutely. Your faith is the ultimate seed mm -hmm. that you need to pass down to that next generation because if you don't plant it, the world is not going to. And so that's, that's like the continued thing that you can see. Like, if you went back, all my family's preachers, most of them, um, and – like even the women passing it down to their daughters and, you know, the fathers passing it down, like your dad would keep you powder dry. You know, it might sound different in each generation. My, my expression of it may sound different, but the message is the same. Yeah. And so faith being the ultimate seed that you need to pass down, followed by those vegetable seeds and things that you need to pass down and teach them how to keep them properly. Right. I love that. Well, thank you, friend. This has been fun. We'll definitely have to see this again sometime. Yeah, we will. Maybe Mark won't be working. He's still over here working on this spreadsheet that he has to do. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> well, we'll catch you again sometime soon. And thank you, everybody who's been watching. We've been reading your comments so, as we do. Yeah, I've been seeing comments scrolling up through there, and I didn't get to read them all because I was focused on the conversation. But, yeah, yeah. thank you. And I hope to see y'all again. Listen, we'll talk. You know, I'm a talker, so just anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, have a good day, everybody. Bye. We'll Bye. see you.